This evening, uh, Professor Yaqub is going to talk to us about uh, mineral bone disorders in, in chronic kidney disease. Uh, so over to you, Professor Yaqub. Uh, thank you very much, Vivek, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I would like to extend my uh, greetings to all the people who are listening to me. Uh, it seems as if all of you are in front of me. Uh, I would uh, confess that this is my first webinar and being a technophobe, I'm quite uh, nervous that I may uh, let you all guys down, but uh, Vivek assures me that I'll be okay. So I'll start uh, without wasting much time uh, about this very important uh, topic. And uh, I've slightly made a change that mineral bone disease is in chronic kidney disease, what is new? Because this is what would like to focus for uh, all of you who are listening to me. But before I go to what is new, I would like to go back uh, in my own days when I was a trainee, and I still describe them as a uh, old good, a uh, good old days. And at that time, uh, renal bone disease, which we used to say, was very simple. Uh, the whole thing started when the patient uh, came for dialysis. Uh, before the, that stage, we did not have the concept of chronic kidney disease. In fact, we used to call it chronic renal failure. And uh, bone disease was the last thing on our mind because the whole focus was to prevent those patients going on to dialysis in the first place. And we started thinking about bones only when they uh, started dialysis. And we were, grew up in the, uh, at that time thinking that uh, the problem ha happens only when the patient reaches dialysis because phosphate load increases. Uh, kidney cannot get rid of enough phosphate which we eat. That increased phosphate combines with ionized calcium and reduces calcium, which triggers the parathyroid gland to make more PTH or release PTH. We were also aware from the work in 1970s that one alpha hydroxylase, which makes 25 vitamin D activated, existed in kidney, so that levels would be low. So we had couple of things that high phosphate causing a low calcium, which will trigger a parathyroid release. At the same time, we knew that one of the inhibitor of release of PTH, which is uh, activated uh, vitamin D, was reduced because of its uh, reduced synthesis and combination of the two would lead to high uh, PTH. And when I was a trainee, concept was emerging that like calcium sensing receptor which in fact was discovered in 1990s uh, there must be another phosphate sensor in the parathyroid which in fact would stimulate parathyroid gland to make pth and calcium is there to release it which is already been preformed as a result of high phosphate but we didn't know more than these conce conceptual uh, 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 theoretical or speculative uh, 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 observations. So the combination of all this caused high PTH and our focus at that time was to reduce PTH, but not to normal level. We knew that the bones in uh, uh, end-stage renal disease are resistant to PTH effect. And we were very happy to drop it down to two or three times upper limit of PTH uh, normal, normal PTH ranges. And this is what all renal bone disease was all about when I was a trainee. At the same time, we knew that uh, when the PTH comes, the purpose of PTH is to infect in people who are uric to lower phosphate by causing increased phosphate urea. PTH, as we all know, upregulates 1-alpha hydroxylase, so it will make 1,25 vitamin D. And also, PTH by acting on the bone will release more calcium and will normalize to some extent uh, ionized calcium. And we all thought, uh, rightly or wrongly, that uh, a new set point is achieved with PTH. Uh, and that is the set point which we need to adjust by using whatever drugs we were using. And we had very limited, uh, we had one or two phosphate binders, one of them which was alucaps or aluminum containing phosphate binder. And we had uh, alpha calcidol, which was uh, a one hydroxylated vitamin D. These were the drugs available, and we adjusted them. At that time, the assay for PTH was very rubbish. 
Uh, it was a seat terminal PTHSA, which was all over the place. In fact, in for, it, it was like a random number generator. So you could not rely on PTH to give you reliable answers. So we did a lot of bone biopsies. And it became very clear to us. Uh, in fact, when I was a trainee, my main job, rather than doing kidney biopsy, which I did, was also to do a bone biopsy list. And we used to see high parathyroid bone disease, osteomalacia or the combination of the two and we also saw a lot of adynamic bone disease and it was always thought that it is due to aluminium accumulation in the bone either due to use of aluminium containing phosphate binders or more importantly uh, it was known RO days of hemodialysis even in Britain believe it or not and we used to dialyze people against an ordinary tap water which was rich in aluminium and those aluminium used to go into the bone and gave us the concept of adynamic bone disease. So that was how simplistic renal bone disease was. And we always used to think mineral disorders in the context of renal bone disease. And that's why it used to be called renal osteodystrophy. Then came a K-Doki classification of chronic kidney disease. Some people loathe it because they think that this classification is false and has artificially created an epidemic of chronic kidney disease, uh, particularly stage two and three A in people who are very elderly. Uh, and many people think that this has unnecessarily created an epidemic. But some who believe that as a result of this classification, we have learned a lot. And, and also, I think our speciality from being a marginal speciality has taken the center stage. All of a sudden, uh, we have been entrusted looking after the health of 10% of the world population who give or take have got some form of chronic kidney disease. And with that also come responsibility that we need to now deliver on these promises that we will be able to prevent progression of chronic kidney disease, but also the complications like cardiovascular disease or bone disease, prevention of those, uh, and that is has brought uh, extra pressure on us. So I think it's, uh, it's a two-edged sword, uh, but this classification has changed our uh, paradigm about bone disease. And in the context of that, now I will ask my main questions, which I would like to address one by one with you why we now call uh, uh, mineral bone disorders uh, as it used to be called renal osteodystrophy. What is the reason behind that change of terminology? I grew up on renal osteodystrophy. Now, now we regard that as an obsolete. We just uh, now call it a mineral bone disease disorder. I'll say a few words about that. Second question is, is phosphate a new dietary toxin? Is subclinical osteomalacia a cause of high PTH in early stages of CKD? Phosphate binders, we still use it. We have got many now, so we have got now choices. And I will just touch base that which phosphate binders are good uh, and when to use them. We have also got more than one vitamin D analogs. Again, I will address a few things, whether uh, uh, when to use them and which one to which one is preferable. We have got now calcium sensing receptor activators, which is like uh, or mimetics, which uh, uh, we are using. Uh, should we be using oral or intravenous? And still, believe it or not, uh, parathyroidectomy has to be done in certain cases. And if we do it, would it be better to do partial or total? So I'll try to address most of these questions, which have been, to some extent, been uh, now refashioned in the context of our CKD classification. And this is uh, the reason why we have changed. I'm, I say, and I apologize that the first slide which I'm showing should be the final slide, but I would like to make this slide with you one by one, adding all these boxes and arrows with you as I go along from now onward, just to say on this slide that because it is not bone disorder which we are now interested. We are interested in the impact of mineral disorders 
uh, which uh, affect the cardiovascular tissue, extra osseous any tissue, even the lungs, even cardiac valve, the calcification beyond and mineral deposition beyond bone uh, gets impaired. Uh, and that's why rather than using osteodystrophy, which was very focused or bone centric terminology, we have now uh, using it in the context of uh, a wider involvement of the body. And also mineral uh, bone disorder sounds good because it is not just purely bone. It also gives us chance to explore other involvement of other tissues. And also, this has been made about because we have now learned that these disorders start much earlier during the course of chronic kidney disease, rather than what we used to believe uh, that they always happen at the end stage uh, sta or at the stage of dialysis or initiation of dialysis. So I'll try to cover some of those. But one thing is that why we call it mineral bone and not being a dystrophy, I personally feel the reason is that we can now see the whole body rather than being focused to bone and a lot of bone biopsy as we used to do when I was a trainee. So let's start with the first. Is phosphate a new dietary toxin? And I think to some extent the answer is yes. Uh, we all now as the world is getting westernized, we are all eating uh, processed food. There are a lot of addi uh, additives which being used. Sometimes they are not even put on the labels of the food which we consume. And a lot of inorganic and organic force phosphate is added to our food as additives. So we have got far more phosphate intake than what uh, a freshly cooked food would give us. And also we have realized that the our phosphate intake overtakes the excretory power or of a kidney of uh, for phosphate uh, even as early as stage two and three. Uh, uh, in old days, we always used to think that these are always stage five problems. We can now, from our uh, investigations in chronic kidney disease cohorts have seen that in fact, there is some evidence that phosphate level may be okay, but urinary phosphate excretion increases much earlier uh, in the course of chronic kidney disease, but it comes at the price. The other player which has come into and which is relatively new as a result of phosphate is that the original thing is the same, that you have high phosphate, which lowers the ionized calcium. Also, the one alpha hydroxylase, sorry, I've gone. One alpha hydroxylase, which I'm using my arrow also starts going down much earlier rather than what we thought before. So at the stage of three or four, uh, alpha hydroxylase is, uh, 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 as deficiency is manifested. And these two would give you high phosphate PTH. But now there's convincing evidence, at least in experimental setting, that high phosphate has got uh, a phosphate sensor, which has not yet been Conclusively proven in human setting, but I think it seems like a sodium phosphate co-transporter uh, in uh, exper experimental model, we call it PET. This is the same transporter which has now been shown that high phosphate X on causes increased synthesis of uh, PTH, but also the same transporter is present in vascular smooth muscle cells which converts those cells into osteoblast. Oh, so that's why vascular calcification starts by phosphate acting on those co-transporters and changing the phenotype. So it's not a passive process. It is an active process, calcification. So this is an, another new paradigm shift in our thinking about uh, vascular calcification. But one interesting molecule, which is been talked about more so, and more trials are done in non-renal failure setting, is sclerostin, which is uh, a peptide produced by osteocytes. It uh, inhibits uh, vent B signal, B catenin signaling, and that is essential for osteoblast uh, uh, homeostasis. So if you inhibit the signaling, osteoblast stops working, and as a result, bone formation goes down. 
and there's now convincing both experimental as well as some clinical evidence that sclerostem is one of the mediators of adynamic bone disease or low turnover bone disease. And that in that context also causes osteoporosis. I'll show you some latest data about the reversal of osteoporosis in general population. The other thing which I believe uh, is a possibility that we never knew that PTH, how does the bone becomes refracted to PTH in CKD? In fact, uh, there is some evidence and it's my personal view that sclerostin is also the reason why bone becomes refractory to PTH because there is an inverse correlation between sclerostin and PTH. The higher the sclerostin levels, the lower the PTH, and it's the other way around. If PTH are high, sclerostin goes down. So there is some other evidence, and it's quite possible that in future, we may be using monoclonal antibodies against sclerostin uh, as we have now recently started using in osteoporotic postmenopausal women, where you, as we all know, has got the highest burden of uh, fractures. And these are the couple of two trials. Uh, the first top slide, uh, uh, trial is a randomized controlled trial against a placebo. And as you can see, that the uh, patient's uh, fracture rates, particularly the vertebral fracture rates, were considerably lower in those people who got a monoclonal antibody against clerostin as against placebo in post-menopausal women with osteoporosis. The other interesting thing, in my opinion, was that the post-hoc analysis of this trial showed that when you neutralize clerostin, uh, PTH level went up. So this is, again, there is some inverse relationship with this. How does that happen? We don't know, but there is an inverse relationship and as we all know, that PTH is one of the best anabolic uh, uh, pep, uh, peptide which we use in osteoporosis to increase uh, bone mineral density. And there was a second trial done recently where they used teriparatide, which is a PTH small molecule of its first 30 uh, or 33 amino acid component of PTH against a uh, sclerostin a monoclonal antibody, which is called Romosuzumab. And when they compared these two in a randomized way, the bone density was much more marked with the sclerostin antibody against teriparatide. And I think the reason was that uh, uh, antibody does two jobs. It increases endogenous PTH, which is a very good anabolic, plus it reduces osteosclerotin, sclerostin, which uh, is an inhibitor of bone formation. So watch. Uh, the literature coming, hopefully we will be using this, but a word of caution that this peptide inhibits bone mineral metabolism, whether by neutralizing that in CKD patient, we will be increasing extra osseous calcification. We don't know. Theoretically, yes, it could be the case, but we will never know till we do a trial, including patients with CKD. So that is future future for you. Uh, this is a new player which never existed when I was growing up, but uh, it's exciting time in the uh, mineral bone disorder. So what happens uh, is that uh, we have got uh, back to the square one. So I've told you that sclerostin goes up with phosphate. It also increases PTH and PTH when it goes up, uh, what does it do? It do these things. Now, these are, I'm talking of stage three, five. So now patients are still uric. And when I said, and I alluded to that urinary phosphate excretion increases, but phosphate level remains the same uh, in uh, from stage three to five, but the urinary phosphate excretion goes up. And this is brought about to some extent by increased PTH. PTH is a very good phosphate uric. PTH would also decrease clerostatin uh, and would that way uh, make it increase bone turnover it and release calcium, so normalize ionized calcium. And it also upregulates one alpha, sorry, alpha hydroxylase. Uh, so it will try to normalize those biochemical abnormality which we expect to happen with declining uh, chronic kidneys or declining GFR with CKD. And this is, so what happens is 
that you normalize all this thing, but it comes at a price of higher ambient level of PTH. That is what, uh, and when does this start? And what is the proof what I'm saying is true? And people have looked at it, uh, the evolution of increased PTH level uh, uh, much earlier in the kidney disease. And according to this, uh, uh, Adira Levine's very nice Kidney International paper, uh, she uh, looking at different uh, stages of chronic kidney disease patients show that PTH in fact starts rising uh, around about uh, a GFR of 40, 45 or so, where my arrow is. And that PTH continues to rise as the uh, GFR declines, but in the end, it keeps calcium and phosphate normal. So PTH is in fact holding the calcium and phosphate normal. And this rising PTH one day will become trouble for bones or for the rest of the body because it will then go into a, ter a tertiary state. Parathyroid will become so big that it cannot be inhibited. So initial compensation becomes pathological at the subsequent stage. And this is a lot of data about this. And is this all uh, about PTH? Uh, maybe. There's other good things which we have learned over the years is that uh, 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 one alpha hydroxylase is not the entire property of the kidney. Uh, alpha, uh, one alpha hydroxylase is in fact present in parathyroid gland. Uh, it is also present in the rest of the body. So the circulatory level of one, two, five possibly come from kidney, but every tissue has got one alpha hydroxylase to cause activation of vitamin D within its own tissue. And that concept didn't exist, it's a novel concept. The other thing which is very interesting in my opinion is that uh, uh, evidence is emerging that the hyperplasia or hypertrophy of the parathyroid gland is mediated by COX-2. There is some experimental evidence that if you knock down COX-2 and give animals a lot of phosphate or induce a high phosphate diet with chronic kidney disease, they don't develop a hyperplasia of the parathyroid gland. So that is again very useful. Clearly we don't use COX-2 inhibitors because of nephrotoxicity, but uh, there could be clever tools found as site specific delivery to parathyroid of some inhibitors of COX-2 by nanotechnology or other uh, technologies in the future, which will again give us or increase our uh, armory against uh, bone disease in future. So that is futuristic. What about uh, vitamin D? Uh, uh, we know that uh, now that uh, vitamin D in its original form can get activated in parathyroid gland. It doesn't have to go to the kidney. Uh, and can this vitamin D be useful? And should we be giving vitamin D to patients with CKD in early stages? Uh, we know that it can uh, activate all receptors. 20, uh, it uh, has got some anti-TB properties. It is anti-inflammatory. Our own work and uh, Vivek and Njar's work uh, lately has shown that uh, vitamin D given to CKD improve endothelial function as well. So should we be giving vitamin D? And what is the uh, evidence that vitamin D levels are low? Uh, before I go into that, I will tell you a story about uh, Finson, Niels Ryberg Finson was uh, a Faroe Island resident and he invented Finson's lamp. He was given a Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine because Finson's lab, lamp uh, changed the management of lupus vulgaris, as you know, it's a skin uh, TB condition. Uh, in East London at that time, we had an epidemic of lupus vulgaris and this lamp, which is shown on this slide, is the original, uh, which is in, in our uh, museum, in our hospital, was given by Queen Alexandra, who is the grandmother of our current queen, to our hospital to treat uh, lupus vulgaris. And the people will come, instead of coming for dialysis, they will sit under this uh, lamp, uh, have phototherapy, and their lupus vulgaris used to get uh, uh, resolved. Uh, Ironically, the dialysis unit which we had uh, was the original place where this phototherapy used to be done. Uh, and this also shows that how ancient our hospital is. Our hospital was built 300 years ago, which is the Royal London Hospital. But in fact, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, where I worked too, uh, was uh, 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 um, 
open in uh, 11th century. So uh, we, we, we've got a very old setup of hospitals here. Uh, but the, the feeling was that phototherapical TB, unfortunately, we had to wait for a hundred years or so after that discovery when it became clear that, in fact, Finson's lab was making vitamin D in the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And this vitamin D was required for toll receptor to kill the mycobacteria. Uh, so this is where the story came that vitamin D has very good adjuvant properties uh, when it comes to TB, in fact, it minimizes the inflammatory burden of TB patients. Uh, we have shown it ourselves that vitamin D levels are incredibly low in patients much earlier in chronic kidney disease. And if you were to look at it, which is appropriate for our talk, that the Indo-Asians who live in my area, as well as uh, Afro-Caribbeans, the in incidence of vitamin D insufficiency is astronomically high as compared to the local population. So clearly, vitamin D levels are lower uh, in both Asians and Blacks, as well as in whites, but more so in the other two ethnic groups. Uh, and we know that. Uh, we also know from literature that if you give very high dose of cholecalciferol, which is a vitamin D, uh, it lowers uh, inflammatory cytokines in end-stage renal disease. And another interesting thing, which is a new player, in anemia management or a relatively new player called hepcidine, which is a, a peptide produced by liver to inhibit uh, uh, iron absorption from the gut. Uh, it uh, is basically uh, why our chronic kidney disease patients don't absorb iron very well. Uh, but because it is a pro-inflammatory, it is produced as a result of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, some people have looked at that whether giving them high dose of polycalciferol will reduce hepcid level. And this slide clearly shows that if you were to give polycalciferol, remember these are vitamin D, they are not activated vitamin D given to a uh, chronic kidney disease patient. And you can see that the hepcidin levels falls down, which will relate or translate to increased absorption of oral iron and won't have to rely on parenteral iron. We, one of, uh, I hope, uh, one of my uh, uh, trainee who was here and had done his uh, research and has now moved to India, Tarun Kosik, he did very interesting uh, pragmatic randomized controlled trial in our dialysis group and was able to show that giving col uh, algocalciferol, which is uh, a vitamin D coming from vegetarian source, uh, why we use that was because we have got a lot of vegetarian in our dialysis program. So in order to respect their religious belief, we chose algocalciferol. Clearly, we showed that the uh, time average hemoglobin, uh, uh, which we looked at it, was much better. And the EPO requirement went down. Uh, like uh, Vivek, as I mentioned, we have also done, uh, or we did the randomized placebo control trial and were able to demonstrate that in CKD patient with vitamin D deficiency, just giving vitamin D on its own improves endothelial uh, uh, function, and it was because uh, of uh, 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 upregulation of uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthesis. So we published this in PLOS One, and subsequently it has been uh, uh, validated in a study done in India by Vivek and Jha's group uh, in a randomized way, showing similar findings. So it's very, very reassuring that when your findings are proven by another reputable uh, group, and we were very pleased to see this, uh, that our work was uh, subsequently uh, proven uh, right in a different country with different group of people. Is there any evidence that some clinical or osteomalacia due to this vitamin D deficiency drives some of the hyperparathyroidism which we see in early phase chronic kidney disease. I think this is a, a proof that if you give vitamin D to patient in early stages of chronic kidney disease, you can lower PTH. So some of the PTH which comes in the early phase of chronic kidney disease is possibly due to vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency which gives you what you would see in an osteomalacia or rickets setting, a high PTH level. And some of the PTH is coming, of course, because of high phosphate. Now, uh, another player enters into the whole uh, uh, schema, which is uh, uh, phosphatonins. 
we always knew that there is an another phosphaturic enzyme which may be coming or a peptide well before PTH kicks in in chronic kidney disease. Uh, and we uh, had that inclination, but it was a very accidental finding uh, in a tumor related osteomalacia patient uh, uh, many, many moons ago where they found that uh, a phosphate tonin called FGF23 was released by some mesenchymal tumors, which led to phosphaturia and caused increased uh, phosphate, uh, uh, low phosphate level in people with normal kidney function. The same FGF23 was then cloned, and we learned about this uh, uh, peptide, which is, as you can see, is a small uh, 250-odd uh, amino acid peptide, uh, again, released by osteocytes in response to phosphate, which is sensed by GI tract, but we don't know what is released in response to phosphate when that reach, uh, when it uh, is absorbed in intestine. We still not know how that message is related to osteocyte to release FGF23 or similar phosphate tonins, which then cause increased phosphate excretion and leave the phosphate level normal in people like you and me. It was again an accidental finding of mutagenesis where people tried to induce mutagenesis by giving mutagen to mice and rats and they found that one of that mutagen, mutagenic mice had a phenotype of uh, uh, premature aging uh, and uh, when they found it, they found that the mutated protein was clotho. It was named after the Greek goddesses which weave the life of, uh, which weave the uh, life and that clotho was uh, again an accidental finding as a part of experimental data. This clotho also exists in humans. When they knocked out FGF23, the phenotype of that mouse was exactly like clotho. That led us to seeing that there must be some sort of a similarity between the two. And it became clear that clotho, in fact, is a co-receptor for FGF23. So FGF23 receptor, apart from heart, requires clotho to have its uh, uh, effect uh, of uh, FGF23 action. So apart from heart, clotho is needed in the rest of the body to bind with FGF23 receptor for FGF3, uh, FGF23 to act, particularly in kidney, that's how FGF23 will cause phosphaturia. Uh, this is the intestinal renal feedback. Uh, I've taken this from a, a JCI paper. But as I said, that intestine, particularly the colon, senses phosphate, senses signal to osteocyte to release FGF23, which then goes to kidney and downregulates sodium phosphate co-transporters to cause phosphaturia. The other thing which FGF23 does, which is different from PTH, is that it in fact inhibits uh, one alpha hydroxylation of vitamin D. Uh, reason being that FGF23 is mainly phosphate, phosphate controlling uh, peptide. Because as we all know that activated vitamin D will also promote phosphate absorption. So FGF23 when it is released, its job is to just get the phosphate level. It doesn't care whether you inhibit vitamin D uh, activation or not. Its job is to control phosphate. Like every other thing, if there is something which is very important in our body, you require not one, but two controllers. So now I've told you that our body has got PTH as a phosphate phosphaturic, which does the same thing in the kidney, down regular sodium phosphate co-transporters, but at the same time, it activates vitamin D. FGF23 does the same thing at the phosphate level in the kidney, but it inhibits one alpha hydroxylation. But in order to control phosphate, we have evolved to have two phosphate control system in our body. That's why I feel that phosphate is exceedingly important in the homeostasis of our body. Now, how come I say that uh, FGF23 is more important than PTH or is comes before PTH? These are the data which will prove it, that when you look at patients with CKD, in fact, FGF23 starts coming in the system at the GFR of 57 uh, and PTH weights 
or PTH level goes up only when the GFR is 45. So you, the moral of the story is that FGF23 comes into play much earlier during the course of CKD. And if I have to be a guessing man, uh, if you have to intervene to prevent phosphate uh, uh, or reduce phosphate uh, 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 absorption, either you use phosphate binder at that early stage uh, of uh, chronic kidney disease, which we never think about, uh, or you at least give dietary advice to the patient to cut phosphate down. This is my impression. There is no data. There is no data being done that phosphate binders used in a big randomized control trial that early on in CKD phase will eventually save lives or prevent future uh, PTH. But theoretically, I can say that that makes sense that rather than waiting uh, till the end stage, feed start intervening much earlier in CKD with either phosphate binders, but more importantly, a proper dietary advice of avoiding excessive phosphate load, uh, we possibly would be able to prevent subsequent epidemic of renal bone disease. FGF23 uh, is much more powerful predictor of mortality in people undergoing hemodialysis than uh, 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 I would say phosphate. I give this uh, analogy that uh, FGF23 is possibly equivalent to glycated hemoglobin. Uh, uh, as we all know, that lactated hemoglobin is a better predictor of uh, uh, diabetic complications than uh, random blood sugars. So phosphate possibly is, yes, still uh, uh, is a predictor, but FGF23 is more stronger predictor. And this sort of a data has now been generated in observational studies for CKD patients or even transplant patients. So the higher the FGF23 levels, the worse uh, the outcome both cardiovascular and patient survival. The other interesting thing, which that's why I wanted to allude to, that FGF23 can give us a clue why uh, patients with chronic kidney disease, even with normal tension, can develop LVH. Uh, and that is uh, uh, an experimental evidence that if you were to get FGF23 and put it on left ventricular uh, uh, myocytes, we have done it as well, that if they undergo hypertrophy. Uh, and this is a very clear evidence that FGF23 on its own can lead to uh, 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 hypertrophy. So FGF23 released when the GFR is between 60 and 45, that earlier on can start working on the heart and can cause LVH. And as we all know, that LVH is the main predominant cardiovascular finding in our patients when they come for dialysis and is associated with inferior survival. So that's again a clue that FGF23 has got not only bone-centric effect of phosphate, it has got effect at the uh, left ventricular stages. Again, in an experimental model, if you were to neutralize FGF23, by the way, FGF23 monoclonal antibody is used in uh, pediatric genetic disorders where FGF23 levels are high, if you use that anti, uh, anti, uh, monoclonal antibody to neutralize FGF23, you can see that most of the biochemical abnormality we see, uh, they like the phosphate level, uh, they go up as soon as you uh, neutralize FGF23, proving that the phosphate levels are normal in early stages of CKD is partly because of FGF23. And if you neutralize that, then uh, phosphate level will go up. And ironically, you can't use this monoclonal antibody in our patients because in animal models, if you were to use this, the mortality of the animals go up. Reason being that now phosphate has gone up and that start having its effect uh, uh, on the cardiovascular system. So FGF23 coming in earlier on in the disease is in fact a compensatory mechanism to keep our electrolytes and minerals within normal ranges. But as a collateral damage, a heart will get LVH and also you want to get vitamin D deficient. So unfortunately, my statement is that there are no free dinners. If somebody invites you for dinner, they expect an invitation back 
Uh, there are no free dinners with FTF23. It tries to do its job to keep the phosphate down and within normal range, but in process ends up causing LVH and other issues in the body. What is the proof? Uh, as I said, that if you give you neutralize fibroblast growth factor receptor, you're neutralizing its effect everywhere in the body. Uh, but we know that FGF23 receptor does not require clotho in the heart for its action. That's the only place where FGF23 receptor on its own is very good. Uh, so we uh, use that knowledge and one can quite easily use uh, an uh, 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 FGF23 receptor inhibitor. And as you can see, that the pro-fibrotic LVH, which, which one sees in animal models of urea, in a CKD, this was uh, almost completely reversed when we use FGF23 receptor inhibitors. Uh, so there is some hope that in future, this sort of a strategy can be used in our patients to prevent them going from, uh, in from uh, fibrotic LVH to uh, a left ventricular failure, as we all know, it is a tragedy in our dialysis patients. Having talked about it, yes, you can reduce phosphate intake or whatever, but at the end, we have to resort to phosphate uh, binders. Phosphate binders, in fact, bind the phosphate from diet and prevents its absorption. Uh, there are, and, uh, and as I alluded to, that they should be thought of much earlier rather than leaving it uh, at the end when the phosphate level rise. Remember, we want to then PTH and FGF23 to come in play in the first place. So if you want to cut phosphate down, they won't rise and cause complication or collateral damage. So what is the evidence and what type of phosphate binders we should use? Uh, there are a lot of studies uh, and the meta-analysis which we have to resort to have done this uh, for us, where they compare calcium versus non-calcium based phosphate binder. And it seems like it that there is some mortality advantage with uh, non-calcium containing phosphate binder and more uh, convincing evidence that coronary artery calcification is lower in non-calcium containing phosphate binder use compared to those uh, with calcium containing phosphate binder. So remember, calcium containing phosphate binder is much, much cheaper and one always have to resort to using calcium as well as non-calcium together with the dietary load of phosphate, as phosphate is not very easily cleared on dialysis. And most of the data which I'm showing were generated in dialysis patients. The other interesting bit, which is being uh, hopefully be thought about, and that is that rather than absorbing, uh, rather than chelating phosphate from the diet, can we uh, um, find drugs which will inhibit the absorption of calcium uh, phosphate? And one of that drug is already in trial, tenapenor, which inhibits absorption of calcium of phosphate from the intestine. And the advantage there is that you just use once daily uh, dose to inhibit phosphate absorption. Uh, nicotinamide or uh, uh, niacin, which is a cholesterol-ring drug, can also cause, uh, can inhibit this, but it's not very well tolerated. And at the moment, we don't have potent mechanism to uh, work on this. And at best, they can only be used as adjuvant uh, in patients who are not responding to phosphate binders or patients who find it hard to tolerate phosphate binders. Uh, vitamin D, uh, we have to do, as I said, that vitamin D is not being produced. And vitamin D is a very good inhibitor of a PTH uh, release or uh, uh, production. Uh, there are several vitamin D uh, analog around. This is not by far the complete list. Uh, the one which is being talked about and used a lot in America is pericalcitol, uh, and that was because of this clinical trial done in America in private hemodialysis facility, where they compared observation, it's an observational data, where they compared pericalcitol treated against calcitriol treated patients, quite huge amount, you can see about th almost 30,000 in each group, and they found that pericalcitol treated patient had better survival uh, compared to calcitriol, and more importantly, when calcitriol patients were switched to pericalcitol, uh, those switched patients did better compared to those who stayed on calcitriol. Uh, still, it's an observational data, but uh, in America, based on this, uh, many centers use pericalcitol, but it's very expensive. 
uh, more far more expensive than calcitriol. We in UK still use alpha calcidol or calcitriol. The last, not but the least, uh, is that uh, almost the end uh, in, is in sight for my talk. That we, and I, I am, I'm sure that uh, one day the the guys who discovered calcium sensing receptor will get a Nobel Prize in medicine. It was a huge discovery. It's not really very relevant for us only, but it has got far-reaching effect. Uh, and uh, I think it was done from John Hopkins, and those guys are going to one day get Nobel Prize. I hope they do, because we need more Nobel Prizes in renal medicine. But having said that, calcium sensitive receptor was uh, cloned that led to the discovery of calcium calcium mimetics, which is in a calcit, which uh, we did some studies in our own group uh, and found that it did uh, by tricking parathyroid of being high calcium outside reduces the release of PTH. And uh, there was marked six monthly biochemical improvement. This was a six month study that at six months, giving sinacalcin, which is a calcium aromatic, improved biochemical parameters of PTH. Uh, so that led to the outcome study, which was, we all know, was evolved study, where people were randomized into two groups. Uh, by far, this is the biggest hemodialysis study ever done. Uh, in uh, our uh, in uh, in the bone field, remember there's almost two million people on dialysis coming three times a week, and we don't have many randomized controlled trials to show for these patients. But having done that, done that, it we realize that how problematic it is to do clinical trials in hemodialysis patients, because despite having such a high uh, uh, patient size, we got the aging wrong. So the age. So the patients who were on semicalcid were one year older than the placebo group. Having said that, when and there were a lot of problems, almost one third of the patient pulled out from the study in each group. And in intention to treat trial, when we looked at the result, there was no difference between placebo and semicalcid in people who had primary composite endpoint, which means cardiovascular as well as to overall survival. Uh, and whichever way you cut it, there was no difference. But when you adjust it for age disparity, there was a uh, favorable response in, fav in, in favor of senecalcid. Those patients who were in senecalcid group lived, uh, lived longer. So again, there is a doubt that should we be uh, doing per protocol or, so there's a lot of post-mortem of this clinical trial. At the moment, it seems like that we don't have a conclusive proof, but indications are that senecalcid does not do any harm, if anything, there may be an advantage. So now I'm coming to the last slide of my own, and that would be that should we be giving oral or intravenous? I think that the intravenous is better because that gives you better compliance or adherence, uh, uh, but the side effects are the same, which are principally gastrointestinal side effect. The last but not the least, still, despite doing everything correct, many patients still develop refractory hyperparathyroidism and we have to resort to parathyroidectomy. I believe that we should be doing partial uh, parathyroidectomy to reduce the mass of parathyroid and then can afterwards treat the remaining parathyroid with so many other drugs which we have got available now. In old days, we did total because we always got a relapse. Now we can control partial uh, parathyroid gland with better strategies we have got at our hand. So in the end, I think I've convinced you that phosphate is a toxin, even in normal people, but more so in people with early stages of chronic kidney disease. And depending upon your economics and the affordability, uh, one can use phosphate restriction in the diet or use calcium or non-phosphate, uh, uh, calcium containing phosphate binders. In my practice, I use both, but more so in those who I think that they're transplant recipient and young uh, try to avoid calcification uh, and try to use uh, uh, calcium-free phosphate binders. Uh, we use vitamin D analogs, but I always use vitamin D analogs after correcting vitamin D deficiency if there is any, uh, because it makes sense and also it makes a common sense. And also I use phosphate up binders first before I start uh, active vitamin D analogs. Uh, we use calcium mimetics as a last resort, and last and the last resort is parathyroidectomy. 
So I've created all these boxes for you, going one by one with uh, all the questions we uh, talked about. Uh, and at the end, I would like to say that for a practicing clinician, it's not the guidelines. Remember, guidelines are for the whole population. For a clinician, your responsibility is for the patient who's sitting in front of you. And in, for that patient, the economics, the cardiovascular status, and his remaining body should feature in what and how you treat his mineral bone disorders. Thank you very much for staying with me for that long. And I hope that I have, despite being a technophobe, not let you guys down by uh, using webinar for the first time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Yakub, for this flawless presentation. I think you are making a fool of us when you say that you are a technophobe and that uh, you are doing it for the first time. This was, this was a perfect presentation, uh, which uh, covered almost all the aspects of uh, chronic kidney disease as, as it pertains to uh, mineral and bone disorders. Uh, I think your point about uh, these disorders uh, moving away from the, the osteodystrophy-centric uh, view that we used to have when we were training, now to understand uh, the, perturb the, the role of all these perturbations in, in the wider uh, context of all the problems that our patients with chronic kidney disease have is really important. And I'm sure there will be a number of questions. So uh, for all the attendees, please, uh, uh, you know how to ask questions. You can either uh, type the question in the question pane or you can uh, raise your hand and uh, I, will, uh, I will go ahead and uh, unmute you. We already have a bunch of questions from uh, uh, from from our attendees, and so I will read them one by one. Right. So the first question is from Dr. Saivani uh, Yalampalli, and uh, it says a 26-year-old female with uh, uh, asymmetric kidney, normal kidney function, uh, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis with nephrotic syndrome, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia with normal uh, pH with osteomalacia, how do we approach? So this is a somewhat different kind of question, uh, which... Yeah. So I, I think that that uh, is more uh, in the line of... So either this lady which you are mentioning with the nephrotic syndrome, obviously that nephrotic syndrome could be a secondary FSGS or whatever, one asymmetric kidney. I don't know what the underlying cause of his nephrotic syndrome, but to look at the hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia, clearly that patient possibly, and, and also osteomalacia, is leaning towards FGF3 or phosphatonin disorder, in my opinion. So what I would advise is to try to find out what is, is it this patient got some sort of Panconi's type syndrome, which is causing all these metabolic mayhem. Uh, and if that is the case, as I said, that people with that sort of a disorder, which have got excessive FGF23 for whatever reason, they can now respond and there was a recent trial in New England General Medicine uh, which showed that monoclonal antibody against FGF23 for patients like this in the pediatric setting normalized uh, most of these uh, uh, biochemical abnormalities. Uh, and uh, they also chose those who are refractory to very high doses of uh, activated vitamin D and high phosphate intake. So they had to, they, they could stop all those by just giving monoclonal FGF23. I've never used it because I don't look after patients like that. Uh, but there is a literature about using, and I I can't be sure, but I think what you're describing, uh, this patient, because of the age and the sort of abnormalities you're telling us, has got some sort of a genetic or acquired disorder which is uh, akin to Fanconi's, leading to phosphaturia and compensatory hypokalemia, which possibly would respond to something like uh, phosphate intake and vitamin D, they don't respond then monoclonal antibody to FGF23. I hope that uh, partially addresses the question. Thank you. Uh, I can see that there is a hand raised by someone, so please bear with me. I will go through the other questions which have been asked and then we will come to, the, come to you. So the next question is from Dr. Vinay Rathor, who asks, when should you do bone biopsies uh, in current day scenario, you did mention that in, in olden days you used to do a lot of bone biopsies. So, what indications do you have currently for doing a bone biopsy? 
So as I said, that it's uh, more of a research tool now than uh, a diagnostic. And the reason why that happened was uh, on two accounts. The one was that our PTH essay, uh, though it's not perfect, but I think is a reasonable PTH essay. Uh, and with that, we now have got essays for FGF23 and a sclerostent stent as well. So we, we've got better biochemical uh, markers of, uh, and also there are certain biomarkers of bone turnover, particularly in the early phase of kidney disease. So that made uh, 